What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy Nicholas here. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Today's a really good one. This might be one of the best pieces of content I've put out there in terms of research and statistics and stuff. So sit back and enjoy. We're doing the top 12 wide receiver rankings. I was gonna do the running back one. I know a lot of you guys wanted to see that one. And I actually had that one done before this one. I, I wrote the blog post last week. However, the draft is tomorrow night. It's Wednesday right now. Things are gonna change. There's gonna be at least one rookie running back that cracks the top 12. So I'm gonna end up having to rewrite it or it's gonna be irrelevant by the time that would come out. So we're just going to stick with the wide receiver rankings for now. Speaking of the NFL draft, I do want to say I want to live stream for the NFL draft. Nothing like crazy. Just kind of sit here or sit on my couch or something and watch it. We can watch it together, you know, just talk and, and bullshit and, and talk about the picks and whatnot. I'm going to leave a comment down below, though. It's going to be the pinned comment in the comment section. If enough people give it a thumbs up, then I'll do the live stream, meaning like don't thumb it up unless you're actually, you know, you would join the live stream. I don't want to do it if there's like four people that are, are going to be coming to the live stream. You know, I want to I want a lot of you guys. I want to talk about the NFL draft as it's going on. I think that'd be fun. So let me know if you want to see that. Go put a thumbs up on the comment that I pin below. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up button on the video. Here's the thing, all the mainstream channels, I'm talking about Pro Football Focus and like ESPN and Yahoo and all these guys are starting to invade YouTube. They finally saw the trend, you know, I'm a social media marketer, but now they're hitting the market, which means less market share for your boy. And the way I keep that up is you guys engaging with me, leaving comments, hitting the thumbs up button, all that kind of stuff. So I know you guys always do, man, y'all are the best subscribers in the world. I know that, but I'm still trying to stay on top of pro fraud ball focus, man. Big dogs is trying to beat the game. So drop a comment down below, hit the thumbs up button and uh, your boy will continue to grow. Anyways, let's get into my top 12 wide receiver rankings for 2018 fantasy football. Numero uno, no surprise here, Antonio Brown, Pittsburgh Steelers. The last time he was not a top five fantasy wide receiver, Gangnam Style was a top five song in the country. I'm talking about back in 2012. So for the last five or six years, Antonio Brown has been a top five fantasy wide receiver. There's no point in me really going into any more depth on this one. Numero dos. The boy D-Hop out of Houston, DeAndre Hopkins, is the consensus number two right now in fantasy drafts as well as my wide receiver two. D-Hop's an absolute animal. It didn't matter who was that quarterback last year. Deshaun Watson getting hurt, Tom Savage, it, it didn't matter. He produced at an elite level all the time. Check out this chart. We're looking at his consistency, and this is what I love most about D-Hop, right? There are a lot of wide receivers in fantasy that have big games, have small games, and it's hard to rely on them consistently, but D-Hop was the exact opposite last year, and this is a wild stat Wednesday I posted on my Instagram which is something I do every single Wednesday. If you're not following me on Instagram, make sure that you do that because I'm putting out a lot of value you won't see via YouTube that way. We're looking at consistency. And then you look at the number of times he finished as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. Eight out of 15 games, 53% of the time. He was a top 20, so a wide receiver two or better, 87% of the time. Never finished outside of the top 38. Just unbelievable consistency out of D. Hopkins. Never a real down game. The best part about this is obviously he's getting Deshaun Watson back. Now, when you look at the splits, it's actually kind of surprising because there are seven splits with Deshaun Watson. Seven games played with Deshaun Watson last year, eight out of it. The numbers are actually pretty identical. Goes to prove that he's pretty much matchup proof, but obviously if you can choose a backup quarterback for Deshaun Watson, you'd want Watson there and he should be ready to go for this season. Average a touchdown a game with Deshaun Watson under center. Seven games, seven touchdowns. That's amazing. So DeAndre Hopkins is my number two wide receiver and that shouldn't be much of an argument here. All right, number Three, also the consensus number three in ADP right now is Odell Beck going ham Jr. Despite all the off-field noise of him being traded of, I don't know, I don't even want to speculate on it because nothing has happened, so I don't want to just talk about nothing for no reason. You know what I'm talking about? That's why people don't get shit done in today's world because we like to talk about nothing for no reason. I'm not here to do that. I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you why OBJ's fantasy wide receiver three this year. I mean, just look at at his splits. These are his career averages, not even splits. His career averages. 
This takes into effect his rookie year where he started out slow and any games where he was limited in injury. This is every game he appeared in. Look at the numbers. Just just let it sink in for a little bit. This is his average game. His average game is 10 and a half targets, 6.6 receptions, 94 receiving yards, and 80% chance of scoring a touchdown. Nearly 18 half PPR fantasy points a game. Yes, Eli is not a good quarterback anymore, but he also hasn't been a good quarterback for Odell in years. He's proven that he can put up these numbers. These are his career averages. These are his numbers that he's done it with a good Eli, with a bad Eli. It doesn't matter. What I like even more about Odell Beckham, or what tells you that there's going to be consistency in his fantasy production, is his target share. He came into the league in 2014. Despite having just 16 targets through the first eight weeks of that season, he ended up with a 28% target share on the team. 2015, the next year, he had a 27% target share. 2016, a 28% uh, target share. Last year, he only played in four games, had a 25% target share in those four games. Those target share numbers are elite high-end wide receiver target share numbers. The top five guys are usually in the league, are usually within like the 27 to 31% range. Odell Beckham is consistently there every single season. No reason to think that changes. They have Shepard, they have Evan Ingram. If anything, him coming back is probably going to hurt Ingram's upside, but that's a whole nother category to talk about. I will be doing my uh, top 10 tight end rankings in, in, a, in a later video. Once I do running backs, then it'll be tight ends. If you missed my quarterback one, I'll link that here and down below in the description so you can check that out. That was a good one. As long as OBJ is on the field, as long as he's in that G-Men uniform, I have absolutely no problem taking him as a top 10 pick as my wide receiver three. And honestly, I think the argument for OBJ, the D-hop might be closer than D-hop to Antonio Brown. Okay, so we all know the top three. This is where things start getting interesting. This is where I put a lot of work into this, and I think you guys are really going to like the next three or four wide receivers that I that I really break down for you. Number four, and I heard some feedback on this one um, when I did my top 30 overall rankings video, which I'll also link here. Devonta Adams is my wide receiver four. Right now, he is the consensus wide receiver nine. MFL 10s from draft app, ADP, data up to this point in the season. And I know, you know, this is going to be a lot different than most people's rankings. However, I do not see any scenario in which Devonta Adams does not finish with double-digit touchdowns in 2018. I wanted to look into Aaron Rodgers, per se, to uh, kind of give you a baseline of what I think Devonta Adams' floor is. You look at Aaron Rodgers. He took over the starting quarterback position in Green Bay in 2008. So, from 2008 to 2017, he, he has averaged, over that entire span, 2.2 passing touchdowns per game. 2.2, when you pace that out to a full season, 16 games, that's averaging thir over 35 passing touchdowns a year. If you take away his first three years, so he was just getting started as the starter, right? Take away the first three years, so 2008, 9, 10. And you look from just 2011 to 2017, which is the last six years, which is the Rodgers that we can expect going into 2018, that number goes from 2.2 up to 2.4 passing touchdowns a game, which paces out to over 38 passing touchdowns a year. So over the last, I think, of seven years, on average, Aaron Rodgers puts up 38 passing touchdowns per game. That's his pace. Okay, so we look at 38. They lose Jordy Nelson, right? They bring in Jimmy Graham. So here's here's what I want to do. I want to be generous. We'll give Jimmy Graham 10 touchdowns next year. We'll give Randall Cobb 7 touchdowns next year. 3 or 4 to the wide receiver 3. We'll give 5 to the running backs. right? And I think that's generous on all accounts. Jimmy Graham, I mean, maybe 10, 8 to 10 is realistic. Randall Cobb, 5 to 7. So I went on the max with all these things. Even giving that 10 to Graham, 7 to Cobb, 4 to the wide receiver 3, um, 5 to the running backs combined, you're still left with... 13 passing touchdowns to go, and that's not taking into consideration Adams' touchdowns. I'm just saying, I just see no way, with the way that Aaron Rodgers scores so frequently, and how often they pass in the end zone and, and near, in the red zone and stuff, there's no way Devonta Adams does not score double-digit touchdowns. And then I look at Adams as a player, right? He was really bad the first year, first two years, or whatever he was in the league, but the last two years, he's been a completely different player, and, you, and it's not just a volume thing for me here when I talk about Adams, right? He is the clear-cut wide receiver one. This is the first time he'll have Rodgers as his quarterback, fully healthy, and himself positioned as a clear wide receiver one, which is something you have to love, but it's not just the volume. He's a good all-around wide receiver. I'm talking about in terms of catching the ball and running after the catch. So last year, there were 67 wide receivers in the NFL that saw at least 60 targets. So 67 saw 60 targets. 
Adams' catch percentage, 69%, nice. 69% catch percentage last year, and I know this is, like, not a great stat to use because, you know, your adjusted catch percentage should be better on catchable targets, but 69% catch percentage ranked 14th among the 67 wide receivers. So he's in the top quarter of the wide receivers that qualified last year in terms of catch percentage. Yards after catch, 4.7 on average, ranked him 23rd among the 67. So that's not fantastic, but it's well above average. So not only is he uh, has a very good touchdown floor, he catches most of the passes, which are going to be accurately delivered by Aaron Rodgers, and he can make yards after the catch. I just, I, I don't see a scenario in which his floor is, is worse than wide receiver 10. So even if you have to draft him at wide receiver 7, and you're drafting him maybe higher than you think he'll finish, his floor is just so safe that I wouldn't be pissed about drafting him high, you know? And a lot of people compare him to, to Mike Mike Evans, and I think that's an argument that a lot of people are going to have this offseason. Thing is, Mike Evans, consistently, every year he's proved this, is not just a small sample size anymore. He is l- like almost dead last in yards after the catch and in catch percentage every single year. I'm talking about like not a, even among qualified wide receivers. I'm talking about every NFL wide receiver. His yards after catch, he'll rank like 115th in the NFL. His catch percentage is consistently between like 50 and 55%. So he's a guy who he- heavily depends on touchdowns. Well, I don't think Adams has to only focus on touchdowns, right? While I think his touchdown floor is really high, he's also going to get really high volume from Rodgers. He can move it, he can move after the catch, and he will catch most of the ball. So I'll take a guy who does all those things, plus has Aaron Rodgers throwing him the ball over Jameis Winston. And I think Adams has proved, you know, over the last two years, finishing as a back-to-back top 12 fantasy wide receiver with and without Rodgers. Um, he's just in a ridiculously good position to succeed. So that's why I have him at four. This next guy, this is as close as I can get to two guys being in the same positioning in terms of ranking. This is like 4A and 4B, or 4 AB and 4 BA. AB, BA, BA, the BA, the BAS and BAS. Number five is Michael Thomas of uh, the New Orleans Saints. This is a much better dis- discussion, I think, Thomas versus Adams than Adams and Mike Evans. Now, this we're going to get into the grit here. This is going to be a good one. So listen closely. If you're undecided on Michael Thomas and where you think you want to draft him, I think this might help you a little bit. This, this is what I was looking at. I, I, I wanted to do kind of a big breakdown of the numbers I saw last year. Michael Thomas is just overall numbers 2016 to 2017. So take a minute to, to just kind of look at these. 2016, he played in 15 games. 2017, he played in 16 games. And you're looking at this chart and a few things immediately kind of jump out to me. The target numbers and the team target share. So he had 19% of the team's targets in 2016. That jumped up to 28% in, in 2017. And remember, when I touched on OBJ, I talked about how that 28% is high-end, like elite wide receiver target share number. So he took that step from being one of Breeze's favorite targets to the real high-end wide receiver one there in New Orleans. You see the target numbers go up. You see the yards and the reception. The thing that dropped here, and this is why fantasy owners were probably a little upset if he drafted Thomas last year and sometimes he wasn't producing. Touchdown number dropped from 9 to 5. His fantasy points per game actually dropped 1.1 half point PPR points per game um, even though he had more receptions and he had more yards. It was those touchdown numbers. But I think that target share number tells you the story that you need to be hearing or seeing is that the fact that Breeze has permanently moved him into the elite wide receiver one there. And this is the next chart that I think we need to take a minute to look at. might seem a little confusing to you at first, but stick with me here. This is Drew Brees and Michael Thomas together. Brees on the left, Michael Thomas on the right. What I wanted to look at was Thomas's involvement in near the end zone. So in the 10 zone, one the 1 to 10 yard line, 0 to 10 yard line, and in the red zone, obviously the 0 to 20. I also wanted to look at Drew Brees passing the ball in terms of air yards. So that's pretty self-explanatory. How many air, you know, there's a lot of sites that do this now, airyards.com. You can look at it's a good free resource. And average depth of throw or average depth of target from Michael Thomas. There's a few things that obviously stand out here. Michael Thomas's involvement in the 10 zone and the red zone. His targets dropped off. I think that was an overall statement of Breeze's involvement down there dropping as well. I mean, look at Breeze's attempts inside the 10 yard line, inside the red zone from 2016 to 2015. 17. Inside the 10 zone, Breeze had 62 pass attempts there in 2016. That number split itself in half. So did the touchdown total. 
31 and 12, down from 62 and 24. It's just the involvement they use down there. And I understand that they have Ingram and they have Kamara, so they like to run the ball a lot. And when they were passing, a lot of the passing attempts went to them. The reason that I bring it up, and it's like obviously going into next year, you're going to say, well, Ingram and Kamara are still there, so they're obviously still going to get a big piece of that, right? I'm not saying they're not. Here's the thing I wanted to look at, his touchdown percentage. So this is a, a stat that I've been getting. I've been liking it more and more because I know a lot of fantasy analysts use this, especially in the podcasts that I listen to. They talk about touchdown percentage, and it, it's like a telling factor in whether not you can expect touchdown regression or positive touchdown regression. So whether or not touchdowns are going to kind of come back up to the norm. Now, Breeze's touchdown percentage with the Saints, uh, so over the last 11 years, is 5.5%. So basically, you, you take all the, um, the touchdowns that he scored and you divide it by pass attempts. So the total percentage of his pass attempts that have gone for touchdowns, 5.5%. Last year, that was all the way down to 4.3%. And what that does is it knocks out like the volume argument. It looks more at an efficiency standpoint, right? And that 4.3% was his lowest total, was his lowest percentage total since he was a charger back in 2003. And you might look at that and be like, well, it's 1%. Does it really matter? And yes, it does matter because when you have pass attempts in the 400, 500, and 600s, those 1%. Are, are big changes. So if he regresses back to the norm, if that 4.3 goes up to 5.5, you're looking at his touchdown total go from 23 to 29. 23 to 29. That's a big jump for 1.2% of his passing touchdown percentage going back up. So if you're expecting Breeze to go back to his norm, that's just average, right? 29 would be his average based on the... And and, and the other thing is he had the lowest pass attempt total that I think he had in his career, or at least pass, like, pass attempts per game was the lowest volume in his entire career. So you can bank on one of two things, either his touchdown percentage going back up to the norm or his volume as a passer going back up to the norm. Or at least, you know, he saw such a big drop off in pass attempts overall. It was a career high in 2016 and then it was like a career low in 2017. So if he meets somewhere in the middle and that pass touchdown percentage goes even back up to 5%, his touchdown total is going to go from 23 up to like 28 to 30. So that obviously bodes well for Michael Thomas and his overall volume and target totals inside the 10 zone and the red zone, which which I love. The other thing about this chart, which is more intriguing to me, is the air yards and the average depth of throw. Now, while you see on Breeze's side of things, his air yards went down dramatically, almost cut by like 35%. Average depth of throw went from 7.7 to 6.9. That 6.9 total was the lowest in the entire NFL, and that was because a large share of his his throws, his pass attempts, went to running backs. So they were obviously behind the line of scrimmage, which brought that number down. The crazy part is when you look at Michael Thomas, though, his air yards shot up from like 1047 to 1424. Almost 70 a game to 90 a game. His average depth of target went from 8.2 to 10.2. So while Breeze overall was not throwing the ball deep as much, When he was, they went to Thomas, which is great because that jump in target share you saw from 19% to 28%, 2016 to 2017, a lot of those came from deep passes, which tells me if Breeze's volume goes up a little bit, right? Like again, he had that career low in pass attempts last year. If the volume goes up even a little bit, which I expect it to regress to at least close to the norm, that's going to be more deep attempts for Michael Thomas. It's going to be more overall attempts. It's going to be more red zone attempts. Um, so I think that five touchdown number was was a low for Michael Thomas. We're definitely going to see that bounce back. The best part about Michael Thomas is he's a guy who's getting targets all over the field. He's a guy who has great hands. He's a guy who doesn't need to depend on touchdowns in order to produce for you, especially in any sort of PPR league. And the reason I have to argue for Thomas is because I know a lot of fantasy owners are going to be skeptical. If you owned him last year to own him again this year, unless you're in a full PPR league because he had five or more catches in 14 of 16 games and he had 65 plus receiving yards in 13 of 16 games so if you're in a full PPR league he was giving you 11 to 12 points a game almost every single game and you're happy with that but if you're in a standard league obviously he was hurting you without scoring the touchdown don't forget though how he finished the season in their two playoff games he caught 15 passes for 216 total yards two touchdowns so that was the michael thomas we kind of expected throughout the season it just so happened that it came in the big time games which is obviously good because breeze was relying on him now i think michael thomas is a perfectly good late first round early second round pick i'm expecting a really big season out of him if there's a wild card if there's one guy outside of like the top three that i could definitely see finishing as the overall wide receiver one is definitely michael thomas he would be my wild Wild card pick. I'm going to be honest with you. I think after the arguments I just made, I probably am going to move him ahead of Devontae Adams. See, I do this to myself. That's good stuff. Good stuff, Nick. Love that. Love that. So I guess this would be a good time to plug it. My ultimate draft guide is officially available for pre-order. 
If you order it from now until July 1st, July 1st, the price will go up. You're going to get a pre-order price. I will link it right down in the description. I will link it right here so you can go to my page, go to the shop. You'll see a big pre-order thing. And the draft guide is basically me combining all of the content I've put together this season, this off season, I mean, summer into one e It's an e-magazine that you can get right on your phone. It'll have my top 250 overall rankings. It'll have positional rankings by tier, including defense and kickers. It'll have my top sleepers, my top busts. I did my top free resources video last week, which is only five of them. I'll probably put in like 15 to 20 of them. It'll have the key off season editions. It's obviously updated weekly, so you don't have to worry about rankings uh, being out of date by the time it comes out. You will have updated versions of it every single week. I'm going to be taking the top five pieces of news from the prior week and just breaking them down fantasy football wise. My analysis, that'll be updated weekly. I'm going to take the top three like most frequently asked social media comments to me that week, break them down weekly, also updated. There's just going to be a ton of value in there. It's going to be super, super, super awesome. So go check that out. Pre-order it now and you'll get it for a discounted price because it will go up on July 1st. And you know the draft guide obviously has my uh, big dog's got to eat Bible which is my huge manifesto. It's like a big article I read at the end, breaking down an optimal draft strategy, regardless of if you're in standard PPR, half PPR. I go position by position and write like an essay on each one and how you should take the strategy to your draft. So it's basically the one-stop shop. There's nothing else you need for your fantasy football draft this summer. It's all in my e-magazine, right on your phone. You can get it on your computer, tablet, completely interactive. There'll be YouTube videos that I won't put out on YouTube that will be in that draft guide. So I'm super excited to bring it to you guys. I think you guys are going to love it. And thank you for listening to me talk about it. Also, yeah, since we're midway through the video, again, if I've given you some value thus far, please drop a thumbs up on the video down below. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Let's get back into the info though. All right, number six, who is also the consensus wide receiver six thus far is Keenan Allen, the LA Chargers. Speaking of LA, I'm going flying out to LA next Thursday. To those of y'all that watch my vlogs, I was out in California for a month from November to December, going back out to LA for some work things for the weekend, and then I'm going down, taking the coaster down to San Diego. I'll be in LA from the 3rd to the 6th, May 3rd to 6th, and then I'm going to San Diego from like the 7th to the 14th. So if any of y'all are in San Diego in that area, let your boy know. Maybe we can meet up for some drinks. We could talk some football. We could talk some life, liberty, love, pursuit of happiness, all that good shit. So anyways, back to the L.A. Chargers. Keenan Allen, we finally got to see what the boy can do in a full season in his prime, and he did not disappoint. Finishing as Fantasy's wide receiver three in 2017. Caught 102 of his 147 targets, 1,393 yards, and six tutties. Tutties. Yeah, he's a slot guy. His 9.9 .9 average depth of target yards is low, but his 9.5 yards per target is actually very, very good. It's higher than DeAndre Hopkins. It's higher than Michael Thomas. It's higher than AJ Green. It's, it's higher than Devontae Adams. So he's really good at pushing the boundaries of volume and the opportunities he gets. Right, So while he's getting shorter passes, he's very good at turning them into longer gains and being more efficient with them, which is what you got to love about Keenan Allen. Obviously, he's a better PPR play than a, than a standard play because he catches a ton of balls, he gets a lot of volume, he gets a lot of targets, and you're not really sure what you're going to get on a touchdown basis. Year to year, I'm not saying that he's Julio Jones at this point, and we know we're not going to get a lot of touchdowns out of him because he had, I think, eight his rookie year, six last year. But obviously, I would never bank on Keenan Allen scoring a ton of touchdowns, but there are there are a few things that say that he can easily score six to eight again next year, and I don't know. I just took a kind of a deep, apologies, my camera shut off, or it hit the 30 minute mark, so it stopped recording. Anyways, I was talking about Keenan Allen. You might be surprised to find this out, considering he only scored six touchdowns, but he led all NFL wide receivers last year in 10 zone targets, excuse me, 10 zone targets and red zone targets. He had 15 10 zone targets, so inside the 10, 10 yard line, 24 red zone targets, which is great to see, obviously, the involvement down there. Problem is, he only scored four touchdowns inside the red zone on 24 targets, four touchdowns inside the 10 zone on 15 targets. Got to be more efficient with those opportunities if you're a guy who doesn't naturally score touchdowns that easily, right? He's not going to beat you for 50 or 60 yard bombs down the field. The other thing that you need to throw into the equation is Antonio Gates. We don't know if he's going to be back. If I had to guess at this point, I would say he's not going to be back. Like why bring him back? He's a shell of himself. And you might say to yourself, like, th does it even matter, right? Like uh, how, why is Antonio Gates in the, in the argument here? The reason is because he was sixth among all 
targets last year in 10 zone targets, among all receivers in 10 zone targets. And he was the second most targeted tight end in the entire NFL in 10 zone targets. Only Jimmy Graham had more than him. He had 10 of them down there. So that's a lot of opportunity if Antonio Gates, you know, is off the field. Obviously, Rivers loves throwing him the ball down there. So that opens up a lot of end zone targets. And, of course, that means Hunter Henry will play more of a full-time wide receiver role, and he'll be more involved down there. They also get Mike Williams back, who's a a really big target, of course. He was their first-round pick last year. So I expect him to, you know, as someone who is really good at catching the ball in the air and taking, you know, pinpointing it and stuff, him to get some of those targets. So while Keenan Allen was really really targeted down there already. There is opportunity for him to get more. So if his numbers fall off a little bit, he can take some of those. But at the same time, they have other targets there who who might take some of those away from Keenan Allen. So I'm not really sure if it's a wash or not, but either way, it wouldn't surprise me for him to finish with six again. I wouldn't be surprised if he finished with 10 next year. The weird thing about Allen's season, or should I say, I mean, it was basically broken down into two seasons when you look at this. Look at the first eight games and then look at the second eight games. He was good in the first eight games, not great by any means, but he was great in the second eight games. It was really two different seasons, right? He was an animal over the last half of the season, and this is the warning I would say to people, people that are trying to get too cute with Keenan Allen, right? If he's your wide receiver three on your board or something, if you're like Brown, D-Hop, and um, Keenan Allen. Here's the thing. You look at those second half numbers, 18.3 fantasy points per game, right? That was like, that's Allen's cap right? That is like, you'd be ecstatic. If you got him doing that every game, that second half of the season, you'd be like, holy shit. I don't think Allen's going to give you that. OBJ, what I pulled up before, his career average numbers are those numbers. So Allen's historic second half of the season last year, which he exploded, and you can't really reasonably project to be the entire season, is what OBJ already averages in every single game of his career. You know, 17.8 half point PPR points a game. Allen averaged about 18.3, I think it was, over the second half of last year. And he was absolutely like crazy dynamite. And it's hard to say that he'll keep up that pace. But OBJ does that shit on on the regular. You know what I mean? Uh, That's his average game. So to those of you that would like to take Allen over OBJ, I ain't going to be mad at you. But like, but I might actually be a little bit mad at you. Just think about what I just said for a minute and and let that sink in. So still going to be heavily involved this year with a great floor. He is River's go-to guy in every every single situation. Keenan Allen, top six wide receiver, definitely for me. Number seven leads us to AJ Green, and I've touched on Green a number of times already. I had the argument of Green versus Julio in my top 30 overall rankings video, so I just kind of want to summarize this. This is a chart I put in that video. I expect a nice bounce back here for him as well as um, Andy Dalton. So as long as they can improve their offensive line, which they've already taken steps to by trading for Cordy Glenn, and hopefully they address the issue more in the draft, you know, the more time Andy Dalton has to throw, the better he is, and the better A.J. Green's numbers have been as you look at historically. They have still no real weapons proven behind A.J. Green, so he's going to get that huge target share, which he's seen a 28% minimum target share in each of the past six years. He's been at like 30, 31, 32 in a couple of those seasons. So there's no reason. It's not like they drafted a a nice wide receiver too. I mean, obviously they have John Ross, Tyler Boyd, but no one expects them to be legitimate 100 target, 110 target guys in that offense. So Adrian Green should get that that elite target share number again. As long as that O-line can improve, I do expect a bounce back for Dalton and for AJ Green. It's not even like AJ Green was bad last year. It's not he doesn't really need a bounce back. I think he finishes like wide receiver seven in fantasy. So that's my thoughts on AJ Green. Now Julio is my number eight guy currently. Oh, by the way, A.J. Green was my seventh ranked wide receiver. His current ADP is wide receiver seven. So I'm on the same page there. This is where things get a little discrepant. Is it discrepant a word? Rather than using there is a discrepancy. Discrepant. This is where shit gets discrepant. If it's not a word, I just made that shiz up, and I'm proud about it. Julio Jones is currently the fourth wide receiver off the board in fantasy. He's my number eight ranked wide receiver. So basically, like, where people are drafting Julio is where I would draft Devonta Adams or maybe Michael Thomas, and it's flipped in that order. So I compared Green and Julio in my top 30. Um, I just personally don't like the inconsistency that you get with Julio. He gets those 35-point games and those 40-point games that could win you a season, but he also has a lot of weeks where you're just like, "Eh," you know, they finally force him the ball. That start Steve Sarkeesian effect is, I don't don't know. I'm going to give him a second year before I get get on him about my dirty birds because I brought this stat up. I forget it was on Twitter or Instagram. You should be following me on both, but look at Kyle Shanahan's first year in the offense. They averaged about 21 points a game. The next year is when they took that leap 
that leap to lead in the NFL. Steve Sarkeesian in his first year, aver- they averaged like 22 points a game. So they actually averaged more under Sarkeesian than they did under Kyle Shanahan in the first year. Obviously, it doesn't mean they're going to take a big jump forward, but I'm willing to give him a second year for that reason before I want to throw the torches at his ass. So I think like, like that got in the minds of the coaches and they were like, oh, I guess we need to force Julio the ball in the end zone. It happened. He had a ton of uh, red zone, a ton of end zone targets, and that equated to him scoring three times on the year. The third most 10 zone targets among wide receivers with 11, and he only scored on one of those. They were just forcing the ball. I don't want Julio on my team because I just don't like the draft capital that you have to put into him as wide receiver four. So I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to be mad at you if you have him ranked in your top five, but these are my personal rankings, and I just, I don't really want Julio above AJ Green or Keenan Allen or Michael Thomas. So... It's real. I mean, it's close between those these last four or five guys between Adams, Tom, from Adams all the way down to Julio is close. And I think that's a tier in and of itself. And again, my tiers will be in my draft guide. That is something that that will be broken up in there. We'll move on to number nine, and I want to rank him lower to be honest with you. It's Mike Evans. Um, he's currently going as wide receiver eight off the board. He's my ninth ranked wide receiver last year. Evans was easily, I identified him as one of the biggest regression candidates. I thought it was easy. He was like my number one bust in my draft guide last year. It was just, there was a lot of red flags to me going into last year. I think he was getting picked like seventh or eighth overall, like overall in drafts last summer. He ended up finishing as wide receiver 18. You know, Evans is awesome in a vacuum. He's awesome during practice, but he can't do a lot of things that like more explosive receivers and elite wide receivers can do in the NFL. Like I mentioned before, his yards after the catch, his catch percentages are always amongst the lowest in the NFL. Talking about like 100th ranked or lower. So he depends on touchdowns and he depends on volume in order for him to to return capital on the draft stock that you have to put into him. Look at his career touchdown totals, right? 12 his rookie year, 3 his next year, 12 his junior year, 5 last year. It's so hard to rely on a guy who can't make big plays and can't make yards after the catch when you're only relying on touchdowns. The easiest thing for me to point out was how you knew he was like picking him 7th overall was a huge mistake. He led the NFL in targets in 2007. 16, right? He had 168 of them. And fantasy owners were like, okay, let's do this. Like, we, we don't get that. We don't eat again in 2017. I'm like, wrong. There were just too many changes in Tampa Bay that offseason, right? They bring in Deshaun Jackson. They draft OJ Howard. They draft Chris Godwin. There was just too many other weapons in the mix for Evans to get anywhere near that target share. And his target share number dropped from 30% down to 24% in 2017. Look at 2018 and none of those weapons are gone. They're talking about Deshaun Jackson is working with Jameis Winston in the offseason. All those guys are still gone. They're another year better in the system. Nothing says that Evans' target share number is going to go shoot back up to that 30%. And obviously, you know, some of that attributed to Winston's shoulder injury. With him back healthy, we still don't have proof that Jameis Winston is going to live up to the hype and he's ever going to take that step up to being an elite quarterback. He might just be kind of in that middle tier of quarterbacks who who at times has shown brilliance and has shown his his arm strength and, and the fact that he can be a really good NFL quarterback. But he, if he can't do it on a consistent basis, he's going to just be in the... In, in that middle, he's going to be in the, what do you call it, in purgatory, in quarterback purgatory. I do expect the big games from Winston. I do expect big games from Evans, but there will be a lot of games where that doesn't happen. Over Evans' his last 20 games, his last 20 regular season games, so they haven't been in the playoffs, so just his last 20 games, he has one game of 100 yards. One out of 20 games, he surpassed 100 yards. He doesn't have a single game in which he caught eight balls or more. I don't know, man. I don't know. Just Evans just is not a player I want to invest second round pick in whatsoever. If he falls to me in about maybe from pick like 25 to 30, I'm okay with that, which is where the other three guys that I'm going to be finishing up this list with are going to be falling. So yeah, that's Mike Evans for me. I might actually take this next guy ahead of him. I don't really know. This seems like a good time to make a little plug. I want to thank my sponsors for, ow, for this video. Fantasy Jocks. I'm going to put this bad boy on for the rest of the video. Ugh. Fantasy Jocks. They are the industry leader in fantasy sports equipment. Woo. Look at this beautiful belt. This thing is gorgeous. So me and my league, my big money league, we all chipped in about maybe like 10 bucks. Actually, no, that's a lie. Fantasy Jocks sent me this for free because they sponsored it, obviously. But that's what you guys can do. Get your league mates. You know, if you do a $50 buy-in, just tell everyone to $62 this year. Grab yourself a belt and you give it to your champion every single year. I actually have to give this to Shane, who won this year. That's me being a bad commissioner, but I need to plug it into the videos. We also get a ring each year for our winner. They have a new version of the ring dropping in uh, June or July, I think, which looks really dope. And there's been a lot. Of, oh, no. 
Oh, so that sucks. But we get one of these each year for our winner, and this is only, I think, like 40 or 50 bucks. So you can throw an extra five bucks in, and you can be like a real NFL team, man. Y'all win the chip, you got the ring. These are awesome quality, really high quality, nice leather, nice plaque here. You can even get the team's name engraved on the side each year for like five bucks. You send it in, and they do that. They have trophies, like Lombardi trophies are sick, rings, belts, trophies. FantasyJocks.com. It will be linked down below. So check them out. Again, thank you for sponsoring the video. I'm telling you, you guys will not be disappointed if you get these. They have draft boards as well if you do your live draft with really cool kits that come with like koozies for the team or koozies for all, all the, the owners and the managers and Sharpie and a timer and all the stuff that you need with the player stickers. So I would highly suggest you check out Fantasy Jocks. They are definitely the number one website in terms of this kind of stuff for fantasy gear. So check out Fantasy Jocks. And we'll move on to number 10 wide receiver ranking. This is Dougie 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 Baldwin, and he's currently going off the board as wide receiver 12. He finished last year as wide receiver 14 in fantasy, 75, 991, 8 stat line. And that's actually his worst finish since 2014. I'm sorry, the garbage truck's going by. People on my street is trash, man. Here for them to, uh, to leave the apparatus. Let me check some emails. I'll check Roto World right now while we're waiting. See if there's anything good there. Oh, I didn't download the Roto World. I just got a new iPhone 8. First of all, this thing's a monster. I love this thing. I don't know how I was living without it. So my iPhone 7 stopped working. Like, I just kept keep getting a no service error up there in the top left. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I live in, in, in America. And I have Verizon Wireless. Give me my damn service that I pay for, right? They tell me that it's a common problem amongst iPhone 7, um, this specific model of iPhone 7s. They tell me that I have the model and that's probably what's causing it. They're like, oh, well, if you if you fail this test that we're going to try at the Apple Genius Bar and we'll send it in for free and we'll give you a loaner. They did the test. Obviously, it didn't fail. Well, you could send it into the Genius Bar for 315 bucks and they'll fix it. Or you can just upgrade and trade that phone in and get like $300 towards the new iPhone. So I'm like, bet. So now I'm on the iPhone 8 and this thing is beautiful. All right, we're on Roto World. Des Bryant not expected to sign before the draft. It's a good move because, you know, every team has a few, you know, every team has needs going into the draft. And again, if you want to live stream with me during the draft, hit the thumbs up button on the pinned comment below. Every team has needs going to the draft, but they also value players. It's the same thing with fantasy football drafts, right? You go into the draft and you're saying like, I want to pick based off value, right? If there's good value, if someone drops later in the round, I'm going to take him. But every team also has guys in each position that they really love like more than other teams. So someone that they really like, maybe a team has, uh, you know, the Giants have a second round grade on a wide receiver that drops to the fifth round, but they really need a safety or something. They might take that wide receiver ahead of the safety, even though they didn't plan to. And then that shores up that that depth chart, right? There's no, if they just drafted a wide receiver with a second round grade, they're probably going to play him and they're not going to have to sign Dez to 10 million or 12 million or whatever the shit he's guaranteed or whatever he wants, which is probably way more than he actually wants, but I don't think anyone's going to sign Dez before the draft. Dalvin Cook has knocked the rehab out of the park. Of course, he's a beast of Dalvin Cook. Antonio Callaway failed his drug combine test for a diluted sample. Antonio Callaway probably won't be in my top 12 rookies video. Here's what I'm going to do for the draft. Here are the two videos I'm going to come out with. I'm going to do on Friday morning or Friday afternoon, whenever I'm done finishing it, I'm going to watch the NFL draft on Thursday night. The next day, I'm going to make a video talking about all the skill players that were drafted. So any quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, tight ends, just for the first round. I'll talk about their fantasy impact. And then when the entire draft is over on like Sunday or Monday, I'll make a video of my top 12 overall rookies for fantasy next year. So I'm going to do those two videos. Maybe I'll do one more. I'm not really sure. If you want to see a diff some other type of video, let me know about that. Um, but those, those, that's what I have in mind for my for the for the NFL draft videos. Antonio you know, Callaway, he's a guy to keep an eye on because Antonio Callaway is super talented from Florida. A lot of off-the-field issues, but if a team takes a chance on him, he is super talented. Gronk is back for 2018. Like, I, you know, I hate the media. They just make shit. Cameron Meredith, oh, that's something else I, I should have talked about with Mike Thomas. He comes in. I like Cameron Meredith a lot. Super talented player. I, I think Mike Thomas is penciled in. Like Cameron Meredith is going to come in and take over that Willie Sneed spot. Actually, Sneed kind of ran from the slot. I just don't see Meredith really having an impact on Michael Thomas's number. Meredith is going to be a nice, maybe a red zone target. He's a bigger guy, more athletic. going to help improve Breeze's efficiency. He's also working back from an ACL tear, so enough of that. Let's get back to the ranking. So Dougie Baldwin, the good and the bad here. There's definitely good sides. There's definitely really bad sides that I don't like. He's still only 29 years old, so he has a few more years 
of really productive seasons with an elite quarterback in Russell Wilson. Getting drafted as wide receiver 12 right now, which has pretty much been his fantasy floor over the last three years, here's the big picture. Obviously, they let go of Paul Richardson. They let go of Jimmy Graham in free agency. What that does is that opens up 36 red zone targets. That opens up 21 10 zone targets from last year. That opens up a lot of deep targets because uh, Paul Richardson average depth of target was like 15 or 15.9 or something. So those are two areas where Doug Baldwin can improve upon, like greatly, right? Deep balls as well as end zone target. That opens up almost 50% of Wilson's 34 passing touchdowns. I think he, I think between the two, they had 16 passing touchdowns, receiving touchdowns last year. A lot of opportunity opens up in that Seattle wide receiver core. This defense basically lost everyone. So there is a ton of shootout potential. And I love my boy Russell Wilson when he's in running gun mode. Fortunately, I feel like they're, they're just putting too much on Wilson. Like they just expect him to just produce even though they're giving him nothing. They have no weapons. They have a bad offensive line, no defense, no running game as of right now. Like, I don't know. I feel like they need to chill and like help help the boy out a little bit. And I think that could be a possible downfall for Wilson. But Doug Baldwin's in a really good position to capitalize on the volume that he could get. What scares me about Baldwin is his inconsistency. Last year, he had um, a lot of bad games. Out of the 16 games he played in last year, he had 50 or less receiving yards in seven of those 16 games. He scored in two of those seven, but that still leaves five complete bust games for fantasy owners. And it's a recurring trend. Those are things that we've seen each of the past three seasons. So even when he finished as like a wide receiver seven or a wide receiver or the wide receiver eight or whatnot, he still had like five or six games, seven games where he's finishing with 50 receiving yards or less. What I'm thinking is that the volume he's going to get back and the touchdown potential he's getting back with Graham and Paul Richardson leaving will help make up for those consistency issues. So that's why I have him ranked down here. I like Doug Baldwin a lot. He's a guy that I, I, I've always liked. Um, he's an underrated receiver. He's not flashy or anything. And that's why people don't love him. But I like where he's at this year to be a little underrated. And if he drops in your draft past like pick 30, 35, I think he's a great value there. Uh, wide receiver 11, Adam stuck on feeling currently going off the board wide receiver 11. He's the first part of this um, wide receiver duo in Minnesota that's going to be pretty uh, draft capital heavy in 2018 fantasy football. Soon to be 28 years old, undrafted free agent, had a major breakout last year after a, a breakout, but a smaller breakout in 2016. Now he's put back-to-back -back years of, of very good production. Finished last year as wide receiver 10, 91 catches, 1,277 yards, four touchdowns. Again, those touchdowns fluctuate a lot. Um, he had five touchdowns in 2016, despite seeing 47 fewer targets. So, Going into 2018, if he's going to get these high target numbers, it wouldn't surprise anyone to see him finish with 8 to 10 touchdowns, would it? No. So that's what I like about the fact that wide receivers, that's you know that's what I really like about wide receivers like Thielen. That's what I really dislike about wide receivers like Evans, the guys who can make plays after the catch, the guys who get a ton of volume and catch a ton of volume are the ones that, you know, when the touchdowns fluctuate, it won't affect them. But when they have the big touchdown totals, they will be in for, like, big breakout season. Thielen, you know, he has great hands, great route running, and he's actually surprisingly fast. I think people under, uh, underestimate this. I think he ran a 4 4 5 40 coming out of college. While you might look at him as, like, a slow, methodic wide receiver, he has other parts of his game that help him succeed. Super consistent, right? Obviously, he was a better PPR play than a standard play. He caught five or more catches five or more passes in 13 of 16 games. And even though he lines up in the slot a lot, he had a 14 yard per reception average last year, which is very good for regardless of where you're lining up on the field. Wild card factor here is obviously Kirk Cousins coming in um, and playing quarterback, replacing Case Keenum. I don't think that's going to have much of an impact, to be honest with you, uh, on Thielen's outlook and his production and his volume. He, Case Keenum was actually really, really good with Thielen last year. And they had a really nice connection, which actually kind of scares me. But I think Cousins, you know, in terms of talent, I think Cousins obviously trumps Keenum. Although Keenum had like a, a really good year last year. So I, I see Cousins putting up similar numbers. I think the pass volume will, will come down a little bit for Cousins. But I think Thielen's a super safe play here. Um, he's going to get a lot of accurate balls from Keenum. He's going to get a high volume play. You know, he's one of those guys who, who can get separation early in his routes, right? Playing from the slot, you have to be able to do that. And being able to do that successfully, which Thielen has proved to do over the last two years, 
means that you're giving your quarterback very easy throws, right? You're giving him layups and stuff like that, and, and you're going consistent, to consistently be a target, a favorite target of the quarterback. And that's what led him to, to being sixth in the NFL last year in yards per route run, Adam Thielen is. So Thielen, between pick 25 and 30 where he's going, is a great, great safe pick PPR play, of course. And I'm not even saying his, his ceiling is, is capped. Like for um, for some guys, you'd be like, he's a great PPR play, but you don't really want to draft him too much in, in other standard uh, in standard leagues or anything. But like I said, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him finish with 7 to 10 touchdowns in 2018. So really like feeling here. Moving to our last pick is Larry Fitzgerald. My wide receiver 12 currently going off the board as wide receiver 20. I love this, man. Y'all keep sleeping on the boy Fitz. Just keep sleeping. That's fine. Last year is probably my number one sleeper. I think he was my number one in my draft guide as well. When everyone was ranking him around 55 to 60 wide receiver 25, I stuck to my guns and I put him 25 overall. Ends up finishing as wide receiver six. His third consecutive top 12 fantasy finish. His third straight year with at least 108 catches. That is crazy. He's 91 catches away from catching Tony Gonzalez as the NFL's second leading receiver ever in terms of catches. 91 is the number he needs. That's the key number here. So expect that number to be a number in his mind and expect that number to be something the Cardinals strive for 100%. He'll hit that number one, that 91 catch mark, which by itself makes him a really good PPR play. So if you think his numbers are going to dip, I would almost guarantee he's going to hit that 91 catch mark and that's going to make him a good PPR play. Look at the rest of their team. Both John Brown and Jaron Brown are gone. They bring in Sam Bradford, who's an extremely accurate short passer. We know that really high completion percentage on short throws, and that's where Fitz runs his routes. The thing that scares me, obviously, is this Arizona Cardinals offense as a whole. Their offensive line is really bad. Bradford's going to get a lot of pressure, and we know how Bradford holds up. Bradford can't hold up with... If he, he can have the best line in the world, he'll still find a way to get hurt. So... That being said, he should be on his ass a lot, which is not good news for his health, which would obviously not be good news for Larry Fitzgerald. So hopefully Bradford can hold up. Um, either way, Fitz, like I said, runs shorter routes, and the quarterback play shouldn't be that big of a deal. I believe they signed Mike Glennon as their backup, who I don't like really whatsoever, but he's better than having like a terrible backup like they've had over the last few years. Another big argument people made last year is because Fitz is getting older, they want to say that he slows down over the second half of last year. That was a big argument last year, and I loved arguing against that. Now you look at his numbers, right? His, the first eight games versus the second eight games of last year. Did Fitz slow down? No, not at all. His fantasy points went up. His reception numbers went up. His targets, his yards, all that stuff went up in his final eight games. I just think you know what you're getting from Fitz, man. He, he's done it over the last three years, and that's probably what you're going to get. Maybe he falls off a little bit in the stat category, but again, you're getting him at wide receiver 20, um, and that's probably his absolute floor. So if they're going to let him drop to the fourth, fifth, sixth round, scoop up Fitz, and you'll be fine. Pair him with a guy who may be a little more volatile, like a Josh Gordon, and you have a really high upside guy and a really high floor guy. <coughs> Put some goddamn respect on Fitz's name. Zam. Zam. Anyways, those are my 12 receivers. So let's um, circle back down the list. Antonio Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, Odell Beckham. I have Devonta Adams at four. I might move Michael Thomas up. So four or five, Michael Thomas, Devonta Adams, Keenan Allen, six, AJ Green, seven, Julio Jones, eight, Mike Evans, nine, Doug Baldwin, 10, Adam Thielen, 11, Fitzgerald, 12, this will be up on a blog post, so if you want to see any of the charts just in a static form, head over to the site BigDogsFantasy.com. Sign up for the newsletter on the homepage. Just scroll down, put your info in, and you'll get emailed anytime, anytime I drop something like this on the site. I also send out an email, one sleeper, one bust, one fantasy tip or trick every single week. So if you want that extra value via email, make sure you sign up for the list. Go hit the thumbs up button, please, for both if you want to see me live stream during the NFL live stream during the uh, yeah NFL draft live streams in or if uh, just just give me a thumbs up on the video subscribe to the channel if you're new next video will be the NFL draft video um, skill players from the first round so I hope you guys enjoyed as always love y'all go pre-order the draft guide and I'll see you next video